Ghost Hunters retired, like military retired, uh, joining us, Mr. Grant Wilson. Hello, Mr. Mike. How are you? Hey, Grant. What an honor it is to have you on with us tonight. It really is, buddy. Hey, what's up? This is Nick Roth. You're listening to Dead Air. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Primetime Paranormal on a Monday. This is June 3rd in the year of our Lord, 2013. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Hope you had a great weekend. I know that uh, we did, and I uh, want to thank you for uh, coming into our uh, our little crazy little world, both mine and uh, the man who hosts this show with me, uh, the paranormal David Caruso, Mr. Michael Bowler, joining us right now. Mike, how you doing, brother? Outstanding, Mr. Lopez. How are you, sir? Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, I was um, I chatted with you a little bit earlier today too, and uh, I know we were sending some uh, some videos of you guys down to the Fort Worth stockyards, uh, and I was again laughing out loud here, sitting there going, "You're just not a well man, are you?" Never have been. Never have been. Anybody that's known me for more than 24 hours will realize that uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, this is the kickoff to our uh, paranormal show week. Uh, series with the Dead Air family, uh, Primetime Paranormal with Mike and myself. Uh, the number to call in this evening, uh, 1-646-929-2384. That's one 929 uh, Email address, radioshowdeadair at gmail.com. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook, go to Dead Air Paranormal Radio Show. Click like to follow us on all of our crazy adventures. Uh, phenomenal uh, opportunity tonight, uh, Mike. Last night I was uh, helping... Uh, on uh, Matthew Slozer's uh, show on Sundays on our Dead Air family lineup, uh, Sunday Night Dead, uh, on a roundtable discussion at the end of the show, he asked me, uh, who do you have on for tomorrow? And my normal response is, I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along. And uh, just happened to be uh, having a conversation uh, with this gentleman today, and he said, oh, I'd love to come on, buddy. <laughs> he said, uh, he's got the uh, final uh, season finale this Wednesday. Uh, on the Sci-Fi Channel, but Mr. John Zappas will be joining us here in just a little bit. Excited to talk to him about this season and, of course, uh, just in the aspect of the paranormal, his viewpoint and a lot of things that are going on uh, in the community, uh, present, past, and the future. So uh, I want to make sure that uh, we have some time for that. But, Mike, you have a couple of things to bring up newsworthy that uh, had occurred this weekend uh, uh, on a sad side a little bit, but uh, let's get through that right away if we could, sir. Yeah, the actress Jean Stapleton, best known for her role as Archie Bunker's wife in the groundbreaking 1970s sitcom All in the Family, passed away Saturday uh, at the ripe old age of 90 years old. So, full life there, George. Uh, did not really comment on what just natural causes uh, family around her there in her New York City home. So, uh, you know, a lot of great memories with, uh, you know, I, I remember watching a little bit of All in the Family uh, when I was young. Back then, as you said, when we just had the four channels to choose from, but I, I really remember it coming on after the Channel 4 News here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at 1030, right after the news each night, kind of uh, that show that uh, was on five nights a week and kind of put me to sleep with Archie and Edith and uh, Meathead and uh, Gloria. I mean, that uh, wasn't a lot to choose from like we have these days with the 4,000 channels that most people have an option for, plus the Internet. Uh, back then, you had maybe five, six, seven channels, depending on the area you lived in. And that was a staple of late night television back then, after the local news on a lot of a uh, lot of areas. Yeah, it takes you back a little bit too. It was one of my dad's favorite shows, so uh, every week I'd be hearing this theme almost every single time. Phenomenal, though. From I mean, Television City in Hollywood. 
boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Storms that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. And we knew we knew why they were. Dance for girls and men were men. Wish that we could use a man like Kermit Hoover again. Kids need no welfare states. Everybody calls him Gray. G.R. Owens now and Gray knows why. Brings back Again, memories there, doesn't it? It's a staple in American history for all intents and purposes. I mean, it was breaking ground. It talked about uh, uh, some very, very controversial topics, including racism. Uh, I remember Sammy Davis Jr. being a guest on the show. Uh, that was hilarious, though. Groundbreaking, and, uh, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? Groundbreaking show with that. Uh, dealt with one of the first shows to ever deal with racism. And rape with uh, Sally Struthers, the daughter, being raped. Uh, there was a lot uh, of different serious topics, but, uh, again, it was a staple, and, and, and people paid attention because it was all about the All-American family. Uh, you know, uh, Carol O'Connor sitting in his lounge chair watching TV and smoking cigars. Uh, uh, it was a staple uh, in almost every American uh, home watching that show weekly. Um, and a twist, and, and, and I don't mean to use the twist, but at the same time it fits appropriately, for a very ironic uh, tragedy this weekend as well, Mike, tell us about it. Yes, uh, the other thing that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put together, and everybody listening in tonight, pay attention to my Facebook page, The Paranormal Kool-Aid. We're going to do a show uh, on the 12th. Um, if you ever watch the show Storm Chasers, George, uh, on the Discovery Channel, which I think uh, 2011 may have been the last season, but the uh, meteorologist, Tim Samaras, uh, who headed up the crew, they drove the white... I believe Dodge pickup. Uh, they did not have one of the ones that was built to withstand a tornado. Anyway, along with his partner, Carl, Carl Young, and his son, Paul, were among the 11 people that were killed in that latest round of tornadoes and uh, weather that hit Friday night up there in central Oklahoma near uh, El Reno. They described it as an F3 tornado that had taken, George, what, what they say was a drastic turn to the north that tornadoes normally don't do, almost a 60-degree angle headed up in there, uh, he had been reporting up to about an hour earlier with some of the local news stations doing what he did as a scientist up there, and uh, just a horrible uh, chain of events up there in Oklahoma. And for these people, we really have to uh, – uh, Jeremy Jones is going to join us, who is an avid storm chaser out of Dallas, Texas, to discuss this, that they're going to have to kind of reanalyze this, that uh, with global warming that so many of us uh, talk about, I know a lot of people don't believe in it, something's going on. But with this outbreak of tornadoes that's been up in the Oklahoma area and throughout the Midwest, that these storm chasers, uh, with this happening, they, they kind of have to reevaluate now. Uh, you know, not to make a, a mockery of anything like this, but uh, those of us that put, feel like we put ourselves in harm's way going out uh, doing paranormal investigating, going into some of these locations, uh, you know, with negative uh, presences there and things like this, these guys knew what they were up against. These were trained professionals, and these were some of the best in the business. And for this to happen, it's just catastrophic, uh, not only to uh, their family, but the storm-chasing uh, family itself out there. They're really going to have to stop and reevaluate if something like this could happen to such a veteran in that field. Just a horrific day, George. It was a um, – and I know you have a clip to play here in a second, but it was a uh... – Again, the, the aspect of unpredictability in a field of study, and I'm going to address something here after uh, this topic here as well, Mike, but it's exactly that purpose. I mean, this uh, tornado uh, shifted 60 degrees in direction yeah. and, uh, as almost with purpose and lifted up uh, their vehicle and tossed it 200 yards. Uh, you can't survive that. That's that's about the equivalent yeah, to playing yeah. crap. I, you know, just to let everybody know, and not to try to be too graphic about it, from what I've read, if it's correct, uh, Tim was still in the vehicle, strapped in with his seatbelt, uh, but one of the other occupants was found almost a half a mile away, almost a half a mile away from the vehicle. That that tells you what they endured. Go ahead and play that clip, Mike, if you will. Let me see if I got it over here for for George. I believe I do. Righty, here we go, everybody. It's about two minutes long. 
that EF3 tornado in El Reno Friday, possibly the same one that flipped the Weather Channel's tornado hunt vehicle, uh, has claimed the lives of three storm chasers. That's right. They're identified as researcher Tim Samaris, who is a longtime chaser and a friend to all of us here at the Weather Channel. Unfortunately, Tim's son Paul was also killed Friday in El Reno while storm spotting, and renowned researcher Carl Young has also died. And it was a pleasure to work with them, of course, with all three of the storm chasers as part of the Vortex project. Here is a look at the profile piece we filed on storm researcher Tim Samaras just one year ago. If tornadoes are looming on the horizon, he's usually nearby. Oh my God, that is incredible. But make no mistake, Tim Samaras is no ordinary storm chaser. He has much loftier goals. I'm Tim Samaras, and I'm a storm researcher. We still don't have a clear understanding why some thunderstorms create tornadoes and others don't. The other thing that we're trying to do is measure tornado dynamics. How powerful do tornadoes get near the ground? Finding out why things happen is Samaris's number one passion, and it started basically at first. When I was a small boy, I wound up taking apart my mother's appliances to figure out how they worked. You know, blenders, toasters, television sets, you name it. I've taken it all apart, and I've put them back together. Now, this self-taught engineer and forecaster develops and builds just about all the equipment he uses in his research. Whether it's taking measurements inside a tornado. I designed the electronics. I designed the uh, mechanics that hold everything. Or lightning. I love lightning. I love to capture lightning. I've devised some techniques to capture a lightning strike using high-speed photography. He even moved to his current home because of its weather science connection. You can actually look out to the horizon unobstructed to watch supercells roam across Colorado. And as you might imagine, Samaris has seen countless tornadoes but it's the ones he can learn from that interest him the most. As you can see, some of these black soot things, like this one, actually being lofted into the air almost at a diagonal, which clearly shows that we have some incredible vertical motion going on. In the end, it comes down to one thing. In collaboration with other scientists that are doing similar research, we can put all of this research together. But when that happens, then the ultimate saving lives goal will, will slowly approach. So Tim Samaris may offer some help in unraveling Mother Nature's mysteries. I'm meteorologist Mike Bettis. Anyway, a nice little piece, guys, that I found there off of YouTube. There's a lot of stuff out there right now. But once again, our thoughts and prayers go out to Tim Samaris, uh, Paul, his son, and the family of Carl Young, his partner. Uh, thoughts and prayers to their family and friends, and uh, he'll be missed. A, a great contributor to the science that they were uh, unfolding there, George, on trying to help everybody. And early detection, uh, which has changed drastically over the past few years with the research that he was doing um, uh, amongst the others like Reed Timmer and uh, others that we've often heard about. Big travesty. It is indeed, Mike. And, uh uh, again, our hearts and, uh, and thoughts and prayers are out to their families as well. You know, it, again, we talk about risks and what we do in the field, and there are so many other people out there that we consider to be pioneers in other fields as well that understand that there are risks involved with it. And, um, again, you, it's something that people need to be very, very aware of when they step outside the realm of the safety of their home, that there are dangers involved uh, when you're going with, against something that you, is just unpredictable, including our fields. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight with our guest who's uh, in the queue right now as well. We're going to bring him on board uh, at this time. Um, this uh, gentleman uh, basically needs no introduction. Uh, Forty years of investigating uh, a, a, a phenomenal background history related to uh, working in conjunction with uh, the great pioneers such as Hans Holter, uh, his aunt and, and uncle, Ed and Lorraine Warren, and, uh, and many of the other uh, very notable people in this field. Uh, this uh, gentleman is also the star of the uh, critically acclaimed Haunted Collector, whose uh, the season finale is going to be aired this Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, I think this is his 10th visit uh, to the Dead Air family uh, host of shows, so I think he gets his set, a set of uh, steak knives at this point, Mike. So we've got to make sure we ship that out to him. But without any further ado, please welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen, the godfather of the paranormal, a very good friend, Mr. John Zappas. Thank you. And they are Ginsu knives, by the way, John. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
fantastic, buddy. How you guys doing? Doing, doing good, doing good. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, you finally got a little bit of a breather after this season, huh? Well, uh, catching up on it, buddy. Catching up, uh, trying to uh, relax a little bit, but that never usually ends up happening for too long. <laughs> Consider the fact, I mean, you, you came off the filming time, and then, of course, uh, you went right back to doing a lot of residential cases. Uh, you've been running back and forth with the group, with the team. I know uh, last Tuesday uh, you were on with um, uh, Jeff Leeper on our Tuesday show, and uh, all of a sudden, lo and behold, the entire Haunted Collector crew is at your house. So they're talking to Brian, they're talking to Jason, they're talking to Chris. The only ones that were missing were uh, Amy and, and Jessalyn. But uh, you guys are basically nonstop. If you're not filming, you're still doing other uh, investigations that are going on, uh, you probably have an incredible backlog, don't you? Yes, unfortunately. Um, it's hard to catch up on it, so you try to just go through what you can and catch up as you're going along with it. But um, uh, you have to remember Chris uh, Chris Mancuso and um, – because I always call him Mancino, man. <laughs> Chris Mancuso and uh, – Brian, the personal friends. We've been friends for you know a long time prior to the TV shows or anything like that. And we we do hang out and you know we uh, do different things. And the both of them drive me crazy when they come to visit because I have to cook. <laughs> you you're the resident chef, then. Well, I mean, they don't give you a break, do they? No, they don't. No, I told them that. I'm you know I'm resting now. I'm not cooking. But you know again the. Uh, it's just it's always cool and it's always nice to have them over and just uh, hang out. I mean, we only live about an hour apart from each other, so uh, we do get together quite often. And a question I'm sure that a lot of people would probably ask you at a paranormal event or even during your lecture circuit when you go to the different colleges out there as well. When all of these different paranormal uh, investigators get together for a sitting at a dinner or, or, or just have a couple of drinks and have a social time, is it topic of paranormal or is it a as far away you can get from the topics during that time to kind of decompress? It's probably a little bit of both, but, again, there's so many of the guys out there and ladies that I'm very good friends with. I'm personal friends with them. So, again, we, you know, we socialize, and that's what it's about when uh, we get together at the uh, conventions and things. I mean, I enjoy doing that. Uh, you know, hanging out at the bar with everybody, you get to catch up with people you haven't talked to. And a lot of times, you know, I'm talking about families and the kids and what everybody's doing. To me, that that's what it's about when um, I do go to these things. And, you know, as far as, you know, hanging with the other guys, Steve, Tango, Josh, you know, Jason, and a lot of these guys, you know, again, all of us are personal friends. And we all knew each other before the shows and everything else. So, you know, it, it, it's a little different. It, it's different when all of us get together. I'm not interested in, you know, really talking about the shows. I mean, we deal with it all, <laughs> all the time and everything. But, um, again, it's, um, you know, we do more socializing, I, I think, talking about what's happening in our uh, what we call normal lives in comparison to the TV world. We are uh, speaking to the Godfather Paranormal, Mr. John Zappas, and also the lead investigator on the acclaimed uh, television show on the Sci-Fi Channel, Haunted Collector. Uh, do you realize, John, that uh, you, uh, for all intents and purposes, whether it was because of the television show or the respect of the community, that you still are in that category of a sex symbol? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I I get the biggest kick out of that because George, you know me well enough. I don't view myself as anything but Johnny, and as far as whether it's TV or anything like that. But what I get the biggest kick out of, and I continuously see it, is people will compare me or say I Sean Connery and I look alike. I don't see it, but I don't know. An awful lot of people out there see it. John Mike here, and I, I don't know if you remember, but I think the first show I was lucky enough to do with George and you, I had made that comparison to you. I had noticed that right off the bat. I know. It, it, it just amazes me because, gosh, I love, I wish I looked like him. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, John, good... before we go, – go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say before we move on, one of the things that I was curious that I didn't get a chance to ask you last time you were on – is you've had such a grueling uh, season uh, with Haunted Collector, which has been absolutely fantastic. I think the best to date of not just for yourself, but anything that I've seen on television. 
as far as a, a paranormal investigation show this season. But tell us a little bit about John, and, and what is it you like to do once you do get away? Do you like to go fish? Are you a hunter? Um, what's John I love, like to do? I love to cook. I'm very go. big on cooking. Um, it, it, it relaxes me. I've always enjoyed that. And, you know, when we get done filming and we're back home, I think Chris, Amy, and I, that's the first thing. Everybody just looks at each other. Nobody has to say anything now. It's cooking the different things that we hadn't had in months. <laughs> that, to me, is something, you know, that I enjoy doing. I mean, you know, uh, again, all weekend um, I was out trimming trees and weeding and, you know, things like that. Uh, I enjoy doing that and, you know, uh, working out in the yard and uh, recently just doing a lot of things within the museum, trying to open it up and make, make some more room in there and putting shelving up and you know i enjoy doing projects and, and doing a lot of uh, different things like that that relaxes me there you go so maybe a possibility of uh, a show called the paranormal diet with john zappas on the food channel maybe here in a year oh gosh please don't give them no ideas buddy <laughs> please <laughs> I don't know how good I would ever do cooking, you know, in an environment for a restaurant or, you know, a, a diner or anything like that because I think if somebody told me they didn't like my food, I don't think I would be able to handle it like most people. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Well, you know, it's it's been so nice. George and I had Brian on. It was one of the first chances I think George had uh, to talk with Brian. Uh, absolutely wonderful gentleman. Uh, you know, a lot of you, Jessalyn, a lot of the team members have been on Kool-Aid on Wednesdays and on Mondays with George and I. And I had a discussion recently with some people about the competitiveness in the field, which it is out there, which creates a lot of drama. But I'm not sure that a bit of competitiveness is not good, uh, you know, when it's done uh, in good good taste and good humor. Uh, is there a little bit of competitiveness amongst the team there? You mean, uh, are you referring to them on the show, or are you yeah. talking about in general? Well, uh, maybe both ways. We'll start with the show. Uh, do, you know, do the guys kind of uh, razz each other? Do, do, do you guys go out to some of the locations, and maybe somebody gets skunked or somebody else? Because uh, you guys have gotten so much fantastic evidence this, this season that, uh, uh, you know, we didn't really keep score or anything like that on who it was. I think it was pretty much mixed amongst but uh, is there some competitive juices with your investigators on the show? Not as far as, you know, uh, getting in there, working with each other, uh, working with the equipment and everything. I mean, as far as all the kids go, yeah, they're all competitive against each other. <laughs> yes, you know, you, you're going to have that. That that That's a given. I try to get out of scenes, and they try to get in them. <laughs> so, you know, it again... Um, I think it's a, it, they work pretty good together. I think that especially you, you've seen it more this season than before. And, you know, the running joke is, you know, people literally, literally feel that all five of them are my kids. You won't believe the emails that I'll get when people are asking me. I go, well, three of them are adopted. I said, you know, two are biological. But um, when they all get together and we're in the car Boy, do they gang up on me. One will start, then the other one will start, and I mean, and it's just, all of a sudden, you'll just get me to the point where I'll just go, shut up, everybody shut up. <laughs> now we know why you're so hungry when you're done with this season. You're always up, busy. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, again, it's always intriguing watching them as, the, as they all work together and they do different things because I find it intriguing that they complement each other when they're doing stuff. You know, again, it, it, to me, I've seen that time and time again where they're doing that or, you know, we'll be sitting and go, okay, let's see, who hasn't worked with who in a while? And I don't have an issue where somebody gets, you know, no, I don't want to work with them or no, I don't want to do that. I don't, we don't usually have any of that. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, it, it's where I think, you know, because when you're out on the road like that, and you're w with people, I think a key ingredient is to be able to, you know, dig in there, get to know each other. I mean, I'm like that with the production team. I mean, to me, they, the majority of them all became friends and family. I mean, we just weren't in a working environment. 
that that's important to be able to make things work and to uh, you know get things to flow because people talk more openly and, and you're, you're discussing things and you're going back and forth and to me that that's a uh, key ingredient with uh, trying to do any type of a project you know and to get things to go you know pretty smooth. Do you, do you think that accounts? to the success that, that we've seen you have in this season. We've got one episode left uh, coming up, which I can't wait for. Uh, I believe this Wednesday on the 5th. The uh, the evidence, is, John, has just been overwhelming. I, I know in uh, to try to compare some of the businesses I've been involved in in sales uh, and marketing, and I know George has done the same, that when you get that team together, <clears throat> that maybe everybody from the front office to the warehouse to the sales team that all gets along, that works well together, that the company as a whole becomes very productive and very successful. And that appears kind of with what you're saying and what we've seen with this season because the amount of evidence, dude, it's just been overwhelming with what you guys are showing us. Uh, do you think they're, that's they're bringing, happening? Yeah, they're, they're bringing more to the forefront. And a key ingredient with, with anything to be successful is if you're comfortable with people and you're in an environment where, you know, you can do your thing and you can do different experiments and, you know, you could sit there for, you know, uh, several hours just doing EVPs and doing some of the different things that we do. And it lines up where production is saying, okay, John, you know, or Brian, or, you know, any of you guys, what are you thinking? What would you like to try? Is there some different method or something? Those are all key ingredients that really came to the forefront in the third season. And we would do different things, and they would film it, and people would be happy with it because they learned after an amount of time is just just let – Everybody do their thing. And when everybody does that is when a lot of times you're going to get the different sounds. You're going to get EVPs, and you're going to get a lot of information to come to the forefront. Yeah, and and, and I think we've seen that. I, I, I mean, I've got a lot of questions that George and I want to get into, and I'm going to just throw this one out there. Uh, I, I'm trying to pull the episode up. I can't remember. It's the one with the cloth that was up in the attic sticking out. I believe it was you and Brian that were up there. In the cloth, you ended up finding a package of old clothes with the gun gunshots, the holes in it. Yes. That right there, and, and I could see, and, you know, watching you for the you know the past three seasons and getting to know you here on the show, I know when something startles you. You were startled there, weren't you? That that threw you back a little bit, didn't it? Because here again, too, how I wish, but it, again. It's just the way shows are structured and things. I just wish that they actually show, shown the footage because to this day, I still say that freaking thing was a bat. I still say because there were bats up in the attic. And, you know, again, that's a very common thing with big old buildings and everything like that. But it moved and it jerked so quick, Brian and I almost literally fell back because then I started getting concerned. Production started getting concerned. Everybody was getting concerned because you can hear the bats in there. And I'm just like, do we really want to open this up? Do we? And then I'm standing there, and I wish they showed this part of it because I turned and looked at everybody, and I went, Open it up. Let's see. Something's telling us something here. And that's yeah. it. That's what the whole thing was, you know, and it just unrolled and fell right into place. I mean, when we pulled it out, it was all, you know, pretty raunchy looking and everything like that. And then when I took the rope off of it and started peeling away the the layers there and, you know, we got that bonnet in the center of it, you know, again, when these things occur and these things happen, it's not an unusual, especially with big old buildings or homes or anything. People stash stuff in the walls all the time and in the floors yeah. and in the ceilings. So it, it's not anything unusual to me. But when you do find something and, and you're trying to figure out things, how they're all lining up, that's where it gets interesting because I wish they'd show footage of that when I, you know, spread those things out. And I'm looking and I'm going, how is it tying in? Why is it tying in? We need to find this out or we need to find that out. And, again, that, that's when the whole machine kicks right in. You've got people, you know, the following morning, they're on the phone calling this one. They're calling that one. They're doing this. They're doing that. So there, there's just so much that gets tied in with it, and, and, you know, it's intriguing is the best yes, way I can say it. And like you said, there's there's sometimes just not enough in, in the 44 minutes you guys have to do the 60-minute production there to show and answer all that. 
maybe you could talk them into letting a couple of uh, old guys uh, named George and Mike come join you in the kitchen, and we can sit around and cook and drink and go over some of the footage. And let me and George ask you some questions and give the rest of everybody some answers. <laughs> what do you think? That'd be cool. That would be cool. That would be cool. So uh, that was a bad, huh? That Very interesting. George, what do you think about that? We've discussed that I don't know how many times. Well, it's funny, about, again, great minds think alike, because the first thing I was sitting there going, uh, and I know I, the minute I do this, John's going to take a deep breath and go, George, don't do this to me. But you almost want to sit there and say, maybe it's time for a two-hour paranormal show <laughs> called Hall the Collector, because <laughs> even when George, right, John, I know how to curse people, and you know that. <laughs> Uh, if I look, if I get any packages in the mail that, that are from your address, <laughs> not open. <laughs> no, I know, I, you know, all joking aside and everything, um, out of the 24 segments that we filmed, each and every one of them, with, with the amount of digging in and things going on and things happening, they could have made an hour episode out of each and every one of them. That, that's yeah. how much stuff, you know, goes and, you know, it, it just, you know, again, it's so difficult when you're sitting there watching it because I learned so much this season being behind the scenes and learning how everything works and, you know, having so many people on set, but yet the phone calls are going and people are making connections. This one's calling this one. They're calling home base. They're calling this one. We need a connection here. We need an expert there. We need this. We need that. And it just, it goes, it just continuously goes when you're on a shoot because, you know, again, too, a lot of people say, gee, you know, because it's really a 22-minute segment, uh, you know, and you have two segments per hour. So, again, people say, well, geez, how can you do all this so fast? You know, we we have a huge crew that's out on the road. We have home base. We have other contacts that are around that. Let me tell you, the following morning when we get up and things, you know, I'm throwing things out. We need this. We need to check into that. We we need to get some research on that. I mean, there's just several people that are just digging right in as soon as we're back up the following morning. We uh, we have the very, very uh, unique privilege to speak to our very good friend, uh, Mr. John Zaffis. The number to call in, one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. That's one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. If you'd like to uh, ask John a question personally, go ahead and call in. Pick up the phone. Uh, yeah, it's an important part, John, and I think, you know, for a lot of those that are listening in that may be uh, not part of an organization, part of a team, they understand what the hunt involves, they understand what an investigation entails, uh, because, of the, again, the way the editing is formatted, you know, John and Jesslyn walk into a room, hey, you want to do an EVP session? Yes. They ask three questions and are getting responses. That's not the way it works, but they have to remove everything else over that time frame, and even in some circumstances, you'll show a session where there's no results as well, but there's so much more that has to be removed from that, as you said, because it's basically 22 minutes per segment leaves you to have to take a lot of the painstaking involvement out of it. But again, explain to a lot of people who may not have ever been on an investigation how much more is involved to it than what is seen on that show. Well, again, just for that 22-minute episode, there's 120 hours filmed so again you know when you're looking at this and i've always found it very intriguing how any show gets put together because as footage is submitted back in they call it bay and that's the editing rooms as the, you know they're submitted back in all these reels of uh footage is going and they're all looking at monitors and you know it, it's amazing and then they have to sit there and basically Take what is the key element and use that to be able to, you know, relate everything together. So, again, a lot of times when I'm sitting watching an episode or any of us, you know, we're, we're, we'll be talking later on and go, oh, they cut this out or they cut that out. So many times Chris will come out and go, Dad, they cut this out. They cut. I, go, I go, I know, Chris, I'm watching it. <laughs> but, again, it's it's that limitation of time that you have, 22 minutes to, you know, get all that in there. So there's hours and hours that go into uh, these episodes like you can't believe. I mean, you know, again, too, people have to understand uh, when we do regular paranormal investigating, you know, this past Saturday night I was just out on an investigation with my team up here in Connecticut, 
you know, you get that set up, you, you interview the people, you talk to the people, and you're there for hours and hours. Everybody's, you know, doing all different types of things and everything. And, again, it, it has to be handled so much differently when you're dealing with TV than you are doing a regular investigation. I mean, you know, I get an email Somebody needs some help. We go with the team, and you show up at your cameras and tape recorders and everything. You can't do that in TV land. There's rules, and there's legal things that have to all be taken care of, and there's a tremendous amount that goes in as far as being able to go on a piece of property, whether it's residential or commercial, from you know a network perspective, a legal perspective, and so many things that, that go in that I learned this season – before you could even go onto a site to film an episode for a TV show. A question from the chat room for you, John, from Melissa, and uh, I'm going to compound this with a follow-up question to it is, uh, how many hours of EVPs and pics and videos are reviewed for the show? My follow-up to it is, uh, who's doing the majority of the review? Is it just a team? Do you have some additional people that are helping to assist in the review? And who's doing the video review? Because some of the video captured this year is a blink of an eye. And if you are, if you look away from the screen for a second, you can miss it. Whoever is watching it has been extremely diligent. How much time is involved in that review time, and how many people are involved, sir? I couldn't. Oh gosh. <sighs> There's several people. Brian's always looking at stuff. I am, Chris, Jason. Um, again, the girls are very big at listening to the tape recorders. I mean, Jess will sit there for hours just going as we're, as there's downtime. And we're sitting there. A lot of times she'll be listening to you know her tape recorder and seeing if captured anything else. And at that point in time, a lot of times everybody will start listening to all of the tape recorders. And if something is captured in the, the footage or something, a lot of times your film crew footage has to be looked at along with, you know, all the other footage from the cameras that are set up all over the place. So it can really get intense, and people could spend hours looking at a lot of different things, and that's not unusual. It's it's a completely different, uh, I guess, 180-degree turn from what people expected from the beginning of, your journey with Haunted Collector because of your involvement with uh, the study of demonology and some of the work you had done with uh, um, Adam Bly and, and as his mentor and working with uh, some different uh, uh, denominations uh, with regards to exorcism performed, that uh, you didn't go all out with the scare factor with this show. You didn't go all out and claim everything to be a demon. Uh, you actually come out with some phenomenal explanations. You and I have talked about this before on the show as well with mm -hmm. regards to scratches not always having to be the, you know, the mock of the Trinity, that it could actually be an animal uh, that uh, is doing that, uh, the spirit of an animal, the potential possibility of many other things other than something that is malevolent. However, my question to you would be, have there been circumstances uh, off the top of your head that you could recall where either for yourself, not so much for yourself, I think, because you always talk about how you can switch it off so eloquently, but for your team members that you were concerned after an investigation that you wanted to kind of keep an eye on them, that there, something just didn't seem right, or you were concerned about events that they experienced that could lead towards something negative that they may experience. Well, absolutely. I continuously do that, not, not only with the, you know, all of us on camera, but behind the scenes also, too. So, again, it's it's not that I'm worried about something on a uh, uh, demonic perspective of any type of the situations. But here again, anytime you're dealing with negative energy, you, you're still going to have the influence that could and will affect people. So I do keep an eye on a lot of things that are going – production people, we have uh, almost 30 people that tie in with that. And I hear this continuously from production. They go, John, we've never worked with anybody like you. And I'll always say, well, what do you mean? They go, you know what's going on all the time. You know what's happening with somebody. You know if something is wrong, whether it's on a personal level or these people are experiencing something on a paranormal level. You don't miss a step. And I go, no. I said, I do not. That's part of my job. 
I said, so whether you're part of production and, and, you know, you're a cameraman, a sound man, or whatever, it doesn't matter to me. I watch because I know how these things work and what they can do. And to me, that's a key ingredient when dealing in, in any of these circumstances. So, again, that, that, that's part of the machine, being able to keep an eye on what's happening with individuals behind the scene. Mr. Bowler. John. Yeah, how long have you been doing this? I, I know, I know, but tell everybody out there how long you've been involved in in what you're doing. Forty one effing years, why? <laughs> um, I want to I, I want to go a little. I, I George, I think keeps me on here because I, I come late, not out of left field, but sometimes the left field parking lot of the ball field. That in doing this, I, I, I've been going hard since about 2007, so five six years. Uh, an interest most of my life, and, and, and a couple of years earlier than that, don't have near the experience you have. Coming on here with George is an online education for me, Mondays and Wednesdays when I do Kool-Aid. Uh, the community, learning from people such as yourself, Grant Wilson, you know Jason, all the guys out there and listening and watching and stuff like that, that I've said to people in a, in a silly metaphor that, that we'd make terrible politicians, or at least I would, because what I told friends and and other investigators two years ago, I may say I was completely wrong back then. I, I, I really, through the research, and I've discovered this or discovered that or listened to this, and I'm going this direction. Could you kind of tell us in those 40 years, maybe a Reader's Digest version, although we do have quite a bit of time tonight, some of the differences and some of the changes you've made over the years and what you've learned some of the mistakes you may feel that you made early and, and, and how you came about the changes to get you where you are today to be so grounded in this field of study. I don't really look at it that I that I feel mistakes were made. I've I, I, I'm going through this path and this journey. I've changed my views on a lot of different things, but that comes from learning and understanding a lot of things. You got to remember years ago. When I started, you know, it was drummed into our heads, you know, somebody got scratched or pushed, you know, if certain things were going on, <gasps> you had a demon in the house or a devil. You know, and again, in my earlier career, I looked at that as that as it being factual and not understanding the concepts and not understanding what we know today. One of the key things with any type of research or being able to move forward in any field, you must always keep an open mind and you must realize, okay, I looked at this at one point in time where I thought this was something completely evil. And then you realize that if a, a human being is a mean, abusive, rotten person, they were drunk or, you know, a drug addict or something, and they were very abusive or like that in life, they're going to be like that in the spirit realm, too, and it doesn't mean that it's something demonic. We know today, PK, psychic kinetic energy. Years ago, when we would refer to a poltergeist case, we always thought, okay, again, that's something tying in with the demonic. We know differently today. You know, from all the studies that are going out, you know, and happening out there that when kids are going through puberty, they tap into certain types of energy, can break things, and they can move things, and it doesn't always necessarily mean that you're dealing with something on a demonic level. So, again, I, I, I feel it's so uh, important, and, and, again, that's my passion for our field is that you you have to evolve. You you have to look at things and take that step back and go, you know what? It, it's not a fact that I was wrong. That's what I was taught. That's what I believed in. But now here I'm reading and I'm getting involved with different things and working with so many other people out there in the field and looking at uh, different ways to analyze things. That it, it, it's a key factor that we continue on that path and, and we always keep that where we can look at something and say, you know what, I learned from this perspective, but today I could say from all the evidence and research and different things that I've encountered, I have to look at it differently. And I have no problem saying that, none, absolutely yeah. none, because once I stop and I just say, no, it's one way, 
and that's the way it is, then no one's going to gain anything, including myself. So that's important. So so right. important in our field. You think it would be fair to say that we're practicing investigators? Yes. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're always doing something or learning something or getting involved with something that, you know, I'll take a step back and, you know, look at something and just go, you know what, I never thought about it that way, but let's try this experiment or, you know, let's poke a little bit deeper into to some of the information we found out. That's important. That, that That's what helps us grow. Right, right. Explanations, uh, some of the questions I uh, come across through, through the show here and personal friends, that in dealing with spirits, uh, so many people will, will, will ask me, why, why are they confined to a certain space? You know, if, if, if it's me when I pass and you know, I'm stuck in this old warehouse where I work that maybe I was comfortable there or whatever, and, and as I tell them, well, maybe the spirit's comfortable there, uh, you know, new places tend to not be uh, as haunted, or at least we don't have a history of newer locations, uh, you know, and things like that. I've had questions like sporting events. Uh, you know, if a, a set of car keys or money can be moved inside a home, uh, why have we never had a sporting event that's been altered with a golf ball that's tipped in? Uh, well, know, look, look, at, look at all the ball field. field. Look at all the ball fields that are haunted. I mean, you know, there's a book put out on it uh, with uh, several of the uh, ball fields out there, again, where there's a tremendous amount of paranormal activity. Um, I do not feel that spirit is confined to any particular location. I feel some spirit choose to stay in one area instead of, you know, you know, you, you would think uh, if somebody's, you know, going to pass away, why in the world would they want to haunt where they work? You would think they'd want to go haunt their house or, you know, haunt one of their relatives. But, again, today so many people spend so much time at work, and that is their life. So, there again, that's why today we have so many uh, office buildings that have a tremendous amount of activity in comparison to what we used to have. So I don't really feel that there's any boundaries on where energy can go or can that energy move from different locations. Yes. How, how much do you feel it's up to us as the investigator, up to people that are there? Do you, do you, I, I guess the question here to start this next kind of area off is do you think there's things going on when we're not around? Oh, and, and, yes. And obviously we would, okay, so you think that activity happens whether somebody is present, whether an investigator or just a, the homeowner, uh, the business owner, or whatever, that the, the spirits are active as often as they wish to be. Well, here again, we have tremendous amount of footage, you know, just out on the Internet with surveillance systems that capture activity going on. And nobody's around. Right. Do you feel they're limited by energy? Do you feel there's a governing body that keeps them from going too far? Um, you know, the question of if, if, if a spirit could come into a home uh, and move keys, uh, slam doors, uh, pull hair, and things like that, could they possibly uh, be preventing accidents, be helping children? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, uh, grandmothers, uh, deceased grandmothers around grandchildren uh, and things like that. Do you feel that if given the opportunity in the right environment with the right people and acceptance that they could do more, or why have we not seen more? In other words, why is it still kind of a mystery to a certain extent that we've, we've proven only so much and we can't seem to take it a step further and say we've got one that will communicate with us on demand when we want it to? Well, that's one of the million-dollar questions, buddy. Um, again, yeah, I, uh, I hear you. I look at this from the perspective that we got more going on today. I feel that when we're involved, because we are an energy source. So, therefore, when you do hear the different stories about a traumatic situation or somebody being ill or, you know, uh, people feel that uh, a deceased loved one came and was able to help them or, or, or they feel, you know, an angelic spirit, an angel, was there and was able to do something. I believe very strongly in that. There, there's no doubt in my mind that these energies and um, uh, spirit, 
does have the capability of doing these things to be able to help people. We don't have all the answers. I wish I could sit here and tell you I understand how this happens or why it happens, but that's one of the million-dollar questions. We really don't know. Hopefully someday we will. What would you say in all your years of practice and research that certain people, when they're alive, uh, trying to interact with spirits, uh, whether it be through prayer, uh, you know, communication like you and me uh, may do on an investigation, can help the spirit communicate, that that enables them to communicate possibly more, whether it be through energy or just acceptance. I think it's both. I, b- I believe it's both. In, in, in what way, if you could elaborate a little bit on that? Well, here again, too, you have to remember um, the, the the element of when a person is doing any type of ritual slash prayer or meditating or anything. Again, you're bringing in energy and you're you're feeding energy, so therefore that can cause other things to intermingle and cause activity to excel. I mean, that's proven. I mean, that's continuous where we see that in a lot of environments when people really get hyped up or, you know, in any type of uh, religious type ceremonies, whether positive or negative. We know that supercharged energy from the people performing whatever it is that they're doing is provoking and is going to get spirit in energy to react to it. I mean, here again, that's uh, proven out, you know, thousands and thousands of years of that happening, dating all the way back to Egyptian times and even beforehand, Native American. I um, want to follow up with one more question, John. I want to take a break, give you a chance to uh, get in a cup of coffee, take a bathroom break, and uh, for everybody else to do so as well. Uh, and then I want to get into some uh, some dark uh, territory, if we will, uh, on the other side of the break. But because of where you are status-wise, you're one of the most highly respected people in this community. And, and, and yes, you still have your critics because there are people out there who have nothing better to do uh, than to just bash on people. And I have seen some of your uh, your blogs and your posts about how ridiculous some of this gets. But you still form the collective aspect of people who are in the same mindset and the right mind about the, the purpose of this field. Uh, look at you as one of the higher levels in the in the hierarchy of this community, uh, who's respected. If a circumstance were set up, and I know this is this is going to be a hard question to really answer, but I want your just your opinion on it, that uh, there was a development in this community, that somewhere along the way uh, you got an email from somebody in Boston, and they said, listen, there's a location, and the spirit responds to us in full sentences every single time we talk to them. They've given us ridiculous answers. I, I go back to uh, the great Carl Sagan, Dr. Carl Sagan, who uh, eventually one of his um, books was turned into a movie, the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, where the contact with the aliens was done, quote, in baby steps. Because of how society is and may not be prepared for the type of responses or answers, if we were able to ask the questions we were able to ask and get full responses, would something like that have to almost be put into a security or a safety net uh, where only a few people would be privy to it because of the ramifications of the answers if we had that kind of contact. And if it doesn't exist today, if it exists 5, 10, 15 years from now with technology and technique, if that capability was there, should it be kept under wraps from the general public? Yes. Yes. Um, Again, um, we're not prepared um, a lot of information and a lot of things that intermingle. And I'll share a little bit of it, George. You and I going back and forth just about the demonology end of it. You know, where again, a lot of information and a lot of different things, you know, really can't be brought out into the forefront because, again, I feel very strongly in regards to the fact that there's a lot of people that, with some of the information, that is out there in regards to uh, right across anything that you're dealing with as far as the paranormal is I, I'm not quite sure a lot of people would be able to 
really take that step back and take a look at it and realize and just say, wow, this just blew everything right out of the water that I've ever learned or anything from a religious perspective. So I would honestly say in a perspective of as of today, I think some of the things that I know and some of the things that I've been involved with, I would not publicly talk about or bring to the forefront, and there's reasons for that. Uh, has it happened already, John, and you're keeping a big secret from the world? <laughs> not that, no, not that I know of, but um, uh, here again, just being involved with certain things and meeting certain people and tying in with things, it, it could blow your mind. It really could. Uh, it, you know, people would hear some of these different things, you know, that I, if I ever did, which I'm not going to because it, it will prove absolutely nothing to anybody, that um, those circumstances, places, and people that I've been involved with over the course of years with some of the things they've been involved with and things, you know, it just it blows your mind because it would take me time to take a step back and reevaluate things. But, again, is it something that I feel uh, the majority of people – would be able to handle no no and i feel certain again at this point things are coming out there's more information coming out but it's like you said earlier in baby steps amen to that we're speaking to mr john zappis the lead investigator and star of haunted collector godfather of the paranormal to call in the number is one six four six Nine two nine two three eight four. That's one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. John, I always like to ask anyway. Could you stay with us for the second hour? You got it, buddy. All right. I'll go ahead and put you, uh, everybody there um, to a break time right now. That means get a chance to get a drink, uh, take a bathroom break, whatever you need to do. On the other side, we're going to delve into the dark side of the paranormal. Joining us, uh, Mr. John Savis, on the other side. Stick with us. You're listening to Primetime Paranormal with Mike and George right here on the Dead Air Family on Block Talk Radio. Frightening little sound you just heard. Uh, welcome back, by the way, to the second hour of Primetime Paranormal with our very special guest, Mr. John Zaffis, a lead investigator and star of the acclaimed uh, paranormal show, Haunted Collector, on Sci-Fi Channel, whose season finale is going to be this Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central Time. Check your local listings. Um, that was the, uh, you know this, John, the exorcism of Annalise. Am I pronouncing it right, Michael, Annalise, or Michelle? How was it pronounced? John? Oh, we're back? Okay. I just walked back in. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. I'm going to have to say again then. I just played a clip. Uh, I'm not putting you to the test by no means. Just uh, uh, you'll remember this, I'm sure. And it's a, a frightening sound to it. Um, this is the, the real exorcism. And, and see if I'm pronouncing this right. Annalise McMichael, is that right? Anna Louise Michelle? Anna Louise Michelle, yeah. Let me listen to it again. the case over in Germany? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, uh, that's the Anna Louise Michelle that's over in Germany. Yeah, um, it's it, it's the real deal. It's this is not Hollywood makeup or anything of that sort whatsoever. And, and um, again, there is a uh, a very very scary trend going on. And I wanted to start at the uh, top of this hour with this particular topic. Again, you and I had a phone conversation about uh, two weeks ago about this too. Uh, and just by circumstance, I just happened or happenstance walk in today. Uh, I go to uh, some of the local pawn shops from time to time, and I look to see uh, if there are some cameras, video cameras, uh, even audio equipment that may have been uh, pawned off. You look at great values on some equipment and see the quality of it. Uh, and as I'm talking to the guy about what I do for a field of study, he says, oh, yeah, there's another guy that just uh, came in the other day, but he's a professional investigator. And I said, well, why did he call himself professional? Well, yeah, he charges. 
<laughs> I said, oh, okay, yes, yeah, it's how he makes his living. There is a uh, topic uh, we discussed recently about even uh, people who will charge to remove uh, demonic entities uh, from a location. Uh, kind of delve into the arguments that uh, you've maybe been engaged in, um, either on uh, an interview or in, in personal discussions, John, about the dangers, not about the aspect of charging, but uh, putting people into harm's way for the aspect of profiteering, that, that they may really create a scenario that never even existed, but because they come in and, let, and, and basically sell them on the idea that there is some kind of a demonic infestation, the dangers involved psychologically for those clients, sir. Well, again, um, the way you have to view things and look at things is I will never charge for an investigation. I never have. Have I been reimbursed for expenses, uh, gas, my team? Absolutely. You know, again, that's the way I view it. That's the way I look at it. But, again, one thing that I've noticed with a lot of the things tying in with the paranormal is that there's some 10th or 11th or 12th commandment that's written out there somewhere, George. i got to find it, that nobody can make any money in the paranormal. Right. Okay? When I find that, I'm going to post that because I still can't find it. Now, <laughs> when going out and you're lecturing and you're doing books and you're doing different things and you charge a fee for it, yes, when you're out investigating, I will probably always have that issue with not charging a family, but to get reimbursed for expenses and you know food and different things like that, I don't have a problem with that. But, again, once you, once you cross that line and you start charges, charging for services rendered, <laughs> you're leaving yourself wide open for a lawsuit. Because, again, That's, if I mean, you can't... If, if you're going to go into a scenario where you hire a plumber, you expect results. You hire an electrician, Correct. you expect... How can you expect okay, results I, from a field of study? Let me well, jump this in is what I'm saying. Question. I'm not quite sure how, again... Um, if you're going in and, you know, you're charging a set fee, I don't know, what is it, per demon that they've got a fee or whatever? I don't know. But whatever it is there that they're doing for the removal of um, demon extraction or whatever the heck it is, I mean, again, you're looking at uh, something where once money's exchanged and you start getting involved with that, and the end result is you weren't able to help that person, you're looking for an awful lot of liability on yourself, number one. Number two, from a spiritual uh, perspective, especially within the demonology community, um, many of us you know, throughout the years have never had a fee for jumping in and uh, helping out people. But, um, George, today the, the whole paranormal community is just, so different from what it was even five or six years ago on what a lot of people are doing or how they're handling things. And today, yes, there, there, there's several different things people have sent me over the years where people are charging to be able to remove demons. I just hope they're successful. Yeah, John, this is one of the things that George and I don't always agree on. And I've often said in this community, it's buyer beware, that if somebody feels they've moved into a location uh, whether they have children there or what, and they're going to look up for a, a, a local ghost team to come in. If they don't have the knowledge and wisdom to do their own research before inviting these people into their home, I'm not sure it's the responsibility of the paranormal community to police their own community because, uh, you know, if we can, we can, but 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 it's still buyer beware, you know. Uh, and, and when it comes to charging, you know, uh, I've been divorced twice. I've paid both ministers not a lot of money, but some, to perform the service. Uh, I would love to be able to sue both of them because the divorce has cost me greatly. I can't. Does that not kind of fall into the same thing here? Mike, you're pushing it here with that. <laughs> All right, come on. That's what I do. Um, no, you, I, you, you know what I'm seeing, though? I, what I'm seeing is, is that on, on a religious manner, you have a lot of... Uh, no, I'm not talking here. about I'm not talking about on a religious level. I'm talking about services provided. 
Yeah, right. I, if someone goes into a house and they're charging them five hundred dollars to do something, and the end result is it wasn't done. Again, it's no different from an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter. And I feel yep. that somewhere down the road you're going to end up seeing a lot of that end up happening. No, no, I agree with that. I don't think that anybody should be able to turn around and say, for a certain price, I can guarantee results. What if, for a certain price, I will come to your location, use my equipment that I have described to you that you've seen on my Internet, uh, my web page, uh, that I will use this, I will videotape this, hand the videotape over to you, the audio evidence, and give you a complete written summation of what we felt we discovered there on the investigation, whether it be accurate, authentic, or not, but all of this will be given to you for a certain price. And? That's it. There's no guarantee if there's something that needs to be removed, if there's a demon present, if there's a spirit present that they're going to locate the spirit, that they're going to be able to let the people know who their spirit is. They may say, we hope to help you in this area, but there's no guarantee. What we can guarantee is we're going to show up, we're going to do the best we can with the equipment we brought, and we're going to give you the 12 hours or whatever we're there of the results of the video, the audio, and everything else that we record and document. We will turn that over to you. Yeah, but there's, there's another you're, horse you're in this not race. guaranteeing nothing. You're not guaranteeing anything. No, we were talking about demonology and we were talking about demon removal. Now you're going and talking strictly about just going in and investigating and just documenting. There's a difference there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Other, guys, the other part to it is the, the, the extra horse in the race, which is the ones who will manipulate evidence to the satisfaction of that guest uh, or that client. When, when you think about that these people – Pay, and and we've talked about this before, John, as well. They'll have three or four different teams come in, and the first three teams come in and say, I can disprove it, I can debunk it, I can show you where your problems are, I can show you that there's nothing going on here. The fourth team comes in, and they charge $300, $400, $500, and they manipulate evidence and go, here you go. Yes, you have a demon in your house, and the, and, and the client is satisfied. That's the bizarre part of this community. It is. I, I, I think I'm understanding that because I'm still, I'm still thinking about what Mike was saying. He's talking about services rendered regardless of end result, correct? Whether correct. charging a fee or not. Right. Okay. Um, again, you know, I look at it as from the perspective most people do it as a hobby. They're going out, you know, investigating. Um, I would never, I'm, I'm talking about John's office per se, I still would not charge re regardless of anything, but that, that's the way I operate and the way I feel. Again, if people are going out there and charging to go in and evaluate and investigate, I don't know, Mike, I just never really gave that too much thought before until you just said it. And, and I, I had neither, and, and I, I probably fall more in line, John, with, with where you're at with this, but you've got to stop and think. You've got a lot of people that love this field. I know a lot of people that uh, maybe come from a lower to middle income type situation. Uh, we're in today's field. Uh, a lot of that equipment out there, your flares and things like that, uh, can get quite expensive for your your weekend warrior. Oh, absolutely. That, you know, when you're doing it pro bono, you're paying for your gas, you're buying your meals on the road, you're this and that. And, it, you know, a trip for me to a, a location just here in Texas to Yorktown Hospital, taking my son and the rest of my team, uh, that's a thousand dollar trip for us down there. By, by the time we're all said and done, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so it's something you have to save for and plan for. Uh, you know, if you can recoup some of this when you're when you're doing other investigations, if you take a haunted location that is not a residential home, that's somebody's hotel that feels it may be haunted, and wants to take your video and tell everybody, come stay at the hotel. Uh, Mike Bowler from Dead Air Paranormal with his crew was here, and they're saying that they uh, captured some EVPs and this and that, and now he's jumped up his rates. Uh, and, and booking in every weekend because everybody wants to come to the haunted hotel. He's profited from me showing up at his location. I didn't make a dime if I, I, I go in and say that I don't need something for an appearance fee to show up and do that. Not saying that I do that, but what about others in the field doing that? I don't know. <laughs> I it, it, Again, you know, it, it depends on how people are looking at things and evaluating things. I mean, if a person, if you're talking about a, a – Mike, I don't know. Can we change the subject? Yeah, we can. No, I agree. It, it, it's a touchy subject with everybody, and I think 
I think the most important thing, and I think me and George have uh, finally agreed on this, is that it is buyer beware. And anybody that's out there, uh, if you're in the field and you're trying to help somebody and you can't go there yourself, uh, just tell them to make sure they're very cautious and careful and check some references before having anybody come in, whether it's a commercial or a residential location. Uh, I think we do agree on that, don't we, George? Oh, without question. I, I, I you know, we, we've gone around and around and around in this aspect of it. And uh, Jeff uh, Leeper, John, if you remember last uh, uh, Tuesday, mentioned something that we discussed uh, a couple days earlier. It was on a Sunday on Matthew Slozer's show, Sunday Night Dead, where we talked about a presiding authority in this community, how necessary uh, it would be to have a group of respected individuals, a team of uh, seven to ten, who were the presiding authority for any team that was out there. Almost they had to have the validation of this group before they could begin doing investigations. And you were top on that list to be able to just sit there uh, and, of course, like you have all the free time in the world, but to just be able to say, yeah, th- these guys, they've got no credibility or this guy's got a criminal history or, you know, they're, they're, they're faking evidence, things of that nature, where, you know, this is a go-to site for anybody who has an issue going on in their home. They have to go through this site before they can have a team investigate with them. Everybody has to be validated. That would be a dream come true for the community because it would take a lot of this uh, witch hunt that, that's going on where one team is trying to suicide another team, uh, both on – the Internet, and uh, any other kind of social media that's out there. So it gets a little bit uh, disgusting and frustrating. But we will change up the subject, John. One of the things I wanted to ask you earlier on, but, again, it's an aspect of where we get a chance to talk to you because we only see the investigator on the show, uh, get a chance to talk to you off air. But from the on-air aspect of it, uh, what does John Zaffis watch on TV? Is he an old war picture kind of guy? Does he watch reality TV? Does he watch TV much at all? Yeah, <laughs> what I what I've gotten uh, hooked on right now, and you guys are going to cringe. I've been watching the Long Island Medium, the Amish show that's on there with the kids from the Amish. I, I just get a big kick out of it. Ah, the and Amish he, Mafia. I, I, no, not the Mafia one, uh, Mike. The other one, the the, ah. the several kids that uh, left the community. But you know, just again, I mean, Duck Dynasty. I love Duck Dynasty because I sit there and laugh. I can just sit there and laugh at, you know, the the type of uh, these shows, the way, you know, they're done, because, again, it helps you unwind and, uh, you know, relax. I like I watching that... Golden Oldies. I mean, that's uh, just, uh, you know, things that, you know, it, it, it depends. I could be just sitting there and you, you never know what I'll be flicking through and all of a sudden I'll just start watching it and, uh you know, find it interesting or the story or, you know, something about it. But if I really want to just sit and just laugh, I watch Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Is that part of your detachment? Like, could you turn on Turner Classic Movies and watch an old 1940s and just completely disattach from this field? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I can sit there and just, you know, totally block that all out and just, you know, watch something else, you know, that has nothing to do with it, you know, any of the old uh, TV series or anything like that. I, I enjoy just sitting and watching them and not even really thinking about the paranormal. It's a big factor, John, too, uh, that um, uh, people maybe need to realize a lot of the times, and again, from prior discussions, and it's important to reiterate uh, for those out there that are investigating who get so uh, deep into it that, uh, that you know everything about them surrounds the paranormal and they need to separate themselves and uh, you have an amazing infectious laugh and you love to laugh and again it's part of your personality to step away from it when uh, we were speaking with um, uh, Brian uh, Kano on the show uh, a couple of weeks back and uh, one of the things that was frustrating to him we used the comparison now that you're saying Duck Dynasty with uh, Deep South Paranormal that um, it's been, <laughs> Go ahead. It's, been, it's been such a restriction for you guys. Uh, you've talked about the frustration, Brian, Jason. Everybody's talked about the frustration that uh, I mean they can't even call you Ziggity because they're like, well, nobody will know who that means. Well, no, yeah, it's John Zavis's nickname that I call him. But but they you know stop filming and go, no, you got to call him John, you got to call him Boss, you got to call him something, and they won't give you any any leeway to be able to show your human side. And then on the same network comes Deep South Paranormal where these guys are out fishing, 
going mudding with their trucks, going out there and wrestling alligators, everything across the board you could think of, and it's just complete antithesis to what they've given you instruction to do. And, and it, it's it's important though would not be if you had the ability to do so. Season four comes up next, and you say, "Listen, we need to show a little bit more levity. We need to show that we we can have fun, and you have to have fun. You have to step away from the serious part of this field." Would that be something you'd love to see? Oh gosh, yes. I mean, again, uh, it bothers me just as much as it bothers the rest of the team. Um, they, there's plenty of times where I'm cracking jokes or. You know, laughing about something or listening there to something we got recorded and, you know, I'll come out with a quirky remark and everybody will start laughing. I mean, you know, to me those are uh, important uh, elements when you're looking at anything within a TV show, um, regardless uh, of, um, like you said, the the structuring of uh, Deep South Paranormal, there's a lot of personality and a lot that, you know, is in the show. Where if you look at uh, Ghost Hunters International, Ghost Hunters, Haunted Collector, Destination Truth, Fact or Fate, they kept them very mainstream. It's almost like, the best way I could describe it to you, I guess, would be like cookie cutter. Yes. So again, yeah. If you know an opportunity of anything where more personality could come out, to me that makes your viewer realize, you know, hey, you know, these people aren't all stiff and they're not uptight and everything. So yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's almost a, a necessary evil in a sense with deep south, deep south paranormal in a sense that. If that does uh, bring some attention for it, then it may rethink for a lot of the producers and the directors and the editors to say, you know what, we need to throw some more humor into Haunted Collector. We need to throw some more humor into Ghost Hunters. We need to throw more in that, the personal aspect, because people can get more of a connection with the investigators in rather than just the evidence. Oh, absolutely. First season, we had a lot of humor in there. Um, where I'd be throwing out my quirky remarks and, you know, going back and forth and everything, and people loved it. And then season two, they made a stop. And I don't know why. I can't answer that for you. I, something else I can't answer. But, you know, again, it's um, something that bothers me probably just as much as everyone else because, uh, to me, that is part of – you know, the show, the what's going on behind the scenes and what's happening. And, you know, a lot of that, when I watch it on the other reality shows out there, people enjoy that. They love that. They they want to know about the characters on the shows. We're coming up on Season 3 finale this Wednesday, uh, the 5th of June, on the Sci-Fi Channel, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 8 Central, uh, Haunted Collector. And what can you tell us? Uh, within the realm of uh, what you're allowed to tell us, what to expect from the season finale, sir? Well, you get to see me and hear me say a few things that took 60 episodes to get to, and that's about all I could tell you. (laughs) (laughs) So, again, um, you know, there's things in there um, that I finally, you know, am able to talk a little bit more freely about as far as you know uh content or why i'm doing something or uh the way i'm approaching something so i was very happy to hear that parts of that did make the cut wow yeah now now yeah, you've got my I curiosity know I did the same thing i know i did proof. the same thing i went you're kidding and i was told though we were able to leave it in there and i'm like mm-hmm okay it took 60 episodes, but we finally got it in there. <laughs> it's a breakthrough, and that's the important part to it. Um, before we could go any further, Mike had asked me to, and we needed this sound bite. I've been trying to find it everywhere, uh, going back through the shows and stuff, but it's hard to find that one particular clip. We needed one particular sound bite from you, John. It's the most famous part of almost every episode before they go to commercial break, and that's when John Zaffis finds something and says, I don't know. Oh, what, he's... <laughs> what? What do you? What do you? When I find something, I need to get this to an expert to see what I can find out. No. Oh, the... What the heck is that? Oh, I know, I know, I know. 
I know. So we need that. We need not using the word heck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but since it's, it's a since it's a family show, and it's a lot of people listening probably have their kids with them as too. If you can edit it and give us one of those emotional, what the heck is that? John Zaffis original uh, plugs. Go ahead. Okay. What the is that? <laughs> John, if you've not, I was going to say that that was exactly that to me is the catchphrase of the season right there. Is I don't know how many yeah. times maybe we should have a count next season to see how many times you say that, but uh, probably seventy percent of the episodes of this season. If you I haven't marketed a shirt yet, John, you need to. Oh gosh, yes. I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I got quite famous for that one uh, this season around. That is true. Uh, for, I mean, the funny part, we got a, we've had a full chat the entire night, and there have been people in there saying, you call in. No, you call in. You guys, you want to call in with the last 30 minutes of the show. Now is the time to do so. If you've always had a question for Mr. Zaffis, please call into the show, one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. That's one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. The funny part it is is that when we've had uh, – as an example, Nick Roth on the show. We get a ton of callers, but it's all teenage girls going, when are you coming to investigate my dorms? <laughs> it's like, it's a, it's a run around. Do, do you, um, getting back to doing what you're doing right now, you're, you're, you're off filming at the moment. You're not doing your lectures yet. That comes up in the fall. So you're actually doing investigations. Do you come across those scenarios where, and we've had that, other teams have talked about that, where you get to a location and they're actually asking, is this going to be on TV? Do you get that from time to time? All the time. All the time. It, again, it, it's, you know, it's it's fashionable today. A lot of people like going on the TV shows. So, again, uh, people will say, you know, uh, is Jessalyn coming? Is Jason coming? Is Brian coming? And I'm like, no, this is the paranormal group that you contacted about the TV show. So it, it's continuous with that. That that's you know I've gotten used to it now after the past couple of years where you know um, people are you know very interested in. It makes you wonder sometimes too. Okay, do we have a haunting going on here, or are you interested in the uh, you know just being on a TV show? Is it uh, now to the point in time almost uh, as your case manager sets these up, they have to almost give a disclaimer and let them know ahead of time? Yes. That's already that has to happen in um, just about every circumstances, or unless because we still have, you know, our cases that come in where people say we're not interested in doing the TV show, so that does make it easy. But like I said, today it's more where people are more interested in going on the TV shows and you know um, and talking about them than they ever were before. So again, you know, it's. Um, it's interesting and intriguing on how people look at things and they view things. And, again, I can't always rule out that somebody doesn't have a haunting or have something going on, and, you know, they're looking at it as, oh, okay, that that's the team, you know, John, Brian, Chris, Amy, that will be coming to their house. They don't realize sometimes that it's two separate things. Uh, my paranormal group, you know, none of the guys are on the TV show. It's, it's, it's a totally separate thing. I, 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 have you ever had a scenario, because of the, the amount of residential cases you've done, that has wound up as part of the show because the case was so serious or so active? No, not yet. Not yet. We're... Um, I've gone out and investigated. So, geez, that's a good one. Um, I haven't had any uh, – the, there's none of the episodes where I could say – I mean, I've been to some of the historical locations that we've done, yes. I mean, Fort Wayne and, uh, you know, a couple of the other places. But, again, um, with residential or, or any of the cases like that, it's never been where I've gone in and investigated and turned around and said, hey, you know what, this would be good for the TV show. It, I don't know. It's just never happened, George. I, I haven't thought also, about it till you just said it. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm right here on dead air tonight. The here you go. You, you and Mike got me all freaking fired up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We do have a, a caller in the queue, John, a good friend of the show, one of our paranormal promoters. Uh, she's an avid listener to the show and uh, uh, wanted to speak to you live on the air. We're talking about our good friend, Claire Connolly. Claire, you're on live with Mr. John Zappas. How are you, darling? I am good. I had a rough week, but you know what? There's always your show and my show, and it makes everything better. But yes, it's there scary. have been a, rough... a lot of questions in the chat room. Oh, well, well go ahead and ask away, darling. And nobody nobody wanted to call in. So the one, Eve, one heart, would not put her question back in. But another one, EX Paranormal, he asks, do you want to be a part of that? And is it really haunted or have they fixed stuff so they can use his name? And I cleaned it up because it sounded like negative toward you, John, like not you specifically, but... The thing was, have people, the way I cleaned it up was, have people try to bring you in just to get your name onto their situation? Or have they faked objects that have, you know, a certain presence about them or whatever? But have they tried to do that through you? Um. I, I, again, you know, being in the field for so many years, yes, people will, you know, want to associate people with their location. That That's a given. That That's not an unusual. Um, has anyone tried to trick me with a haunted item? I really can't say I've had any situations where, you know, there's been anything – that I could think of, you know, right offhand where, you know, usually if somebody's concerned enough where they have an item and there might be energy attached to it, they're more concerned with their environment and their, you know, especially if it's home or something. And I can't really say I've had anyone, you know, uh, uh, to a point where they, they, they've they tried to trick me, no. But, you know, that's a yes and a no to uh, to those questions. I mean, you know, again, uh, historical locations or, um, you know, different places like that. Would they, you know, they like Jay, Grant, John, you know, any of us guys. Would they, you know, they'd like us to come visit and they could turn around. Oh. To, yeah. So that, that again, that that's, you know, that's, that's a marketing. sad moment. I cried. I cried. I didn't even know until this show that he was gone because I don't have TV. Very sad moment. That who's gone? But when one when one steps down, another steps up, and there was your show. And one of the things is a lot of people say things, and, oh, it's all about the money, and, oh, it's all about the exposure. And I am one of your most ad, avid supporters to where you have been around before even Ghost Hunters was around. And one thing that you don't do is you don't name drop. And with your aunt and uncle who I won't say, you know, you don't use that as a clutch to get to where you're going. And you've been there from day one, and you've taken in the people that are going to do what you love, and, and you've just created your own family, and that is so admirable. And and I'm very, very happy that you've done and I'm so glad that there's finally a show on that, that they well, recognize. Yeah, and thank it, you. It, it's um, just really a beautiful thing. It really is. Well, thank you. I, I you know, I, I appreciate that, appreciate that very, very much. I mean, but you have to remember too, back when my career was, you know, when I was getting going and everything, my my uncle always used to push me out into the forefront. He would always say, "Get up there and talk, and go here and do this," and you know, it, it was always that environment where my uncle always basically pushed me to do things and. You know, in the beginning years, yeah, I always used to say I worked a lot with, uh, you know, uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren. So, uh, again, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that I have worked with that turn around and say, hey, you know, I've worked with Johnny's office, which is fine, too. You know, if you've worked with people and, and you admire certain individuals, there's so many people out there that I worked with that, you know, aren't in the forefront or anything like that, you know. I still enjoy intermingling, you know, with all of the uh, people. It doesn't it doesn't matter to me. Status, status quo stuff means absolutely nothing to me. No matter what happens, 
no matter what transpires, you know what, tomorrow is, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the same person I am right now. I'm not ever going to change. I don't care if there's a show or what there is. I'm still going to be Johnny. And that's something that I will never change from being. And, you know, here again, you know, it, it, I don't know. I, when it comes to boasting or anything like that, I've just never really been that good of a person at doing that because I just don't look at things from that perspective. I always respect a lot of the individuals out there in the past, uh, Malachi Martin and my gosh, so many of those people that I've had those opportunities to work with and, you know, uh, hang around with or do stuff with. That That's the way I always look at it. Great question, Claire. <clears throat> and and thanks for the call there. I know George is uh, getting some other calls, 646-929-2384 uh, in the last 30 minutes if you have a quick question for John. John, I have a question for you I want to get in before we lose you. Um, here recently with some friends and neighbors sitting in the backyard over some alcoholic beverages, I came up with the idea of telling everybody how neat would it be if you could have one weekend with family members uh, or, or, or close friends and you're all the same age for one weekend and you pick one location to go to. In other words, your dad's 30 years old, your granddad, you, and maybe your son, you're all in your prime for one weekend to spend it as equals together, not that you're not equals with the difference in ages, but just that everybody's health is good and this and that. So I want to kind of twist that and send it to you. If you had one weekend to go anywhere on the planet to investigate, where would you go and who would you go with, dead or alive? Wow. Gosh, uh, the list is endless um, on people I would like to go you know, to uh, Italy, Greece, the pyramids. I mean, you know, some of these uh, types of locations, these places that are thousands and thousands of years old that I feel, you know, I hope someday before I'm out of here, I get an opportunity to go to just, just to investigate, just to check it out, not only, uh, you know, for as far as paranormal activity, but, again, um, historical value. And I, I I don't know. That that's a hard thing to say. I mean, there's so many people living and dead that I would like to do these things with because that's what I enjoy doing more than anything is you know, groups of people and intermingling and just sitting around in these areas and, you know, uh talking and going back and forth and, you know, doing different things. So they, they, it, it's hard because there's so many things I wanna still see or get the opportunity to go to out there that I just never had that opportunity as of yet. But to to pinpoint, you know, living or dead, gosh, wow, that would be an awful long list. Well, well and I, and I understand that now that I think about that. What, what if we changed it up and set just a vacation night, like a, a night with a Rat Pack in Las Vegas, a Broadway show in the, back in the 20s in New York with, with all the history surrounding the paranormal? Could you pick a weekend to do that with? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't, again, it, it's. I don't know. I, I we just have to think. I mean, again, when I, when I'm doing family things, it's with my kids and my grandkids, right. and you know, just doing things. I mean, that have nothing to do with the paranormal. Well, John, uh, this season got a chance to go to Hawaii and to Puerto Rico. Does John Zaffis tan? Yes. <laughs> and that, that's why I have to cover up with the hat and the coat and everything else because I tan so bad. Now, again, too, Mike, I don't know. Uh, some of the locations in Hawaii, you know, uh, I went with the boys, you know, to go check out some of the very spiritual uh, locations out there. Um, you know, and to me that that was something special. It had nothing to do with the show or anything. It was just going and uh going to those historical types of places. I enjoy you know, I enjoy doing that when we had the opportunity to do it. it was they did more than I did, but <laughs> Yeah. I know we did uh, the Hawaiian Ghost Hunters, uh which had just recently had Jay and Grant out there uh for the Pearl Harbor, uh which is on my short list if I can get out there. Uh, I know the better half would probably kill me if we finally get our uh, Hawaiian vacation, but I'm going to sneak off for at least a day and go check that out and hopefully see if I can meet up with them. That would uh, 
I, I'm, I'm right there with you on that one. Love to go out there and see that. Uh, definitely, I recommend you do it. Definitely. I've been there twice. I got another caller coming up here, John. Uh, one more question, quick, too. If you never delved into the, this field, if you didn't have the heritage uh, that you had with your aunt and uncle and, and the, uh, the the field basically fell into your lap, would you have been perhaps, uh, as far as uh, working for a career, would you have been maybe somebody who was a history professor? Do you love history that, to that extent? No, I'd probably still be doing what I did for 30 years of my life, and uh, that was being involved with the mechanical engineering, uh, developing and, you know, uh, product shooting and uh, different things like that. I'd probably still be doing that if my company didn't downsize. <laughs> I, I remember you mentioning that a long time ago. We were at Eastern State, and you brought that fact up of what you used to do. It was quite fascinating, too, that... You know, again, it, it shows, again, the practicality of, of the process, the way that you think about things as well. Uh, I think part of that is the 30 years of experience uh, from the engineering standpoint on why things happen the way that they do. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you agree that that applies to your field? Yes. But then again, um, when you're dealing with the engineering uh, field, you know, you always try to be able to prove things out. And you you need repeatability. Again, um, does it apply it, at certain points, you can apply it, but again, like most people do, they bust out laughing, especially in the engineering field. They go, how in the world did you ever get tied up with the paranormal? <laughs> you know, coming from that background of uh, troubleshooting and, you know, uh, developing and being in the pharmaceutical end uh, of uh, that part of it. So, again, it, it, a few things would apply, but not really many. <laughs> Let's take this uh, one more caller here as well, uh, Casey, uh, calling in to speak. Casey, you're live on the air with Mr. John Zaffis. Uh, your question, sir. Hey, how you doing? Um, I was kind of wondering, since like, um, wait, what's the like one thing that you look forward to when you go on investigations, or like the one thing you enjoy doing most when you go on investigations? Talking to the people, uh, dealing with individuals trying to figure out what is happening, what is tormenting them, why things are occurring. And, you know, I'll share this with you. Saturday night I went with my team. Several of us went to go investigate. Within 20 minutes, everybody was laughing on the team. Within 20 minutes, I got enough information from all those people to be able to figure out exactly what was going on, how it was going on, and why it was going on. And it was hysterical. They went, how did you, you talk to each person, you know, you talked to several different people, you stood there, scratched your beard like you usually do, and you were able to figure out what was happening and why it was happening. I said, because it's logical. I said, it's the one things that are playing in. And then I told them just to do EVP sessions, use some of that information, you know, that um, we were able to obtain and see if it's all tying in. But again, I, I think just dealing and intermingling with people is a very uh, fascinating thing to me uh, and why things occur, why they happen, and, again, realizing that they're afraid and petrified, and my key thing is to try to help them to understand a lot with the paranormal, that there's a lot out there that we really just don't need to fear. We're taught to fear everything. Cool. Does that answer your question, Casey? Yeah, that answers it pretty good. All right. I appreciate it. And thank you for calling in as well. Thanks, buddy. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left here uh, right now, John. I, I want to get to uh, the potentiality of, uh, dare I say, season four. Um, we pretty much all expect this to be a reality. What would you like? What would John Zappas <laughs> like to see? A reality. <laughs> It is reality. Um, I don't. I, again, too, we're uh, just coming up on uh, the last episode airing. I don't know what's down the pike. Um, you know, as far as uh, the TV show or anything, as far as all that goes, there's few other things that, um, within the genre, if you will, that I'm very interested in doing. Um, in regards to a few things in a, par in a paranormal capacity, 
So I don't, I, I really can't say what's down the pike as far as anything goes or, you know, what's even happening with the show, whether it's renewed, canceled, or whatever. I have no clue. Uh, would you uh, look at something that you'd like to change uh, if there's a season four or add to the show if there's a season four? Well, just what we were talking about earlier. Um, I feel, you know, uh, being able to bring a little bit more of the uh, personalities of each and every one of us out and hopefully getting that a little bit more into the show, I think that would, um, you know, that'd be super cool. If we're going to do the, the James Lipton on the couch interview with John Zaffis, and I was asked certain questions uh, regarding <laughs> this field, topics like what really makes John angry during an investigation? When are we talking about regular paranormal investigating or TV investigating? <laughs> Oh, we got time for both. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, again, when we have things going on, um, when we're filming an episode for TV, and, you know, um, you have to realize cameras have to be set up in certain areas, and I have a tendency of changing everything, and then they have to move cameras and everything, and then they make you stop. And when you're doing an EVP session and, you know, you're, you're getting evidence or, you know, you're getting different things occurring, and they go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, hold on for one minute. we got to reposition it 20 minutes later. You know, so that's one thing I think that, that is very difficult from just being an investigator perspective because, to me, you just got to let it go. Let it go. I don't care. You know, we're getting something, we're getting information, just uh, uh, keep going, you know, forward with it. Um, doing our regular investigations, I think today, just like a lot of people that ha are in our field for a length of time, and I think it bothers a lot of us is that, you know, we're trying to help clients, we're trying to help them and give them information and things like that. And today, a lot of people just don't listen to anything we have to say, George, and it gets very frustrating. The uh, what makes John absolutely thrilled uh, while investigating? That we're able to find something and substantiate it, um, to be able to give someone information that's going to be able to help them, you know, whether it be with a paranormal or on a psychological level. When you're able to do that, to me, that means that something got accomplished. Even, I, I don't care what it is. If it's the most, you know, minute thing, if you're still able to do that and give that information to an individual and be able to help them just a little bit, you still accomplish something. How do you want to be remembered in this community? I don't know. I just want to be remembered. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I would probably say uh, more so I'll probably go down in history as being more as a rebel and more of a type of individual that, you know, again, knowing something and looking at it and evaluating it and going down a different road to be able to resolve things and, I don't. I, I don't know, George. George, how am I going to be remembered? Mike, how am I going to be remembered? Tell me. As the Godfather of the paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you. know. You know. Again, I don't. I, when it comes to things like that, it, it's difficult for me to to look at That's, things like that because I don't look at myself like other people do. That I, people are always telling me. I just don't. I'm just like, yeah, so, big deal. I mean, but but that's me, and that's just the way my, my personality is. I just don't look at myself as, you know, anything really all that big and substantial with the paranormal community, I guess. I don't know. John, it, it, and you are, uh, I, I think your humbleness is, is what's brought you to that level with us. Well, my, my kind of final thought with you is that, that Casey – uh, who called in is a uh, not only a, an investigator but a friend of mine, a young investigator uh, in mm -hmm. junior high out in Arlington, fan of the show. I've, I've met with him and kind of take him uh, under my wing from time to time. That I call us early pioneers of this field. I, I don't put uh, myself on the level with, with you or George uh, with the experience that uh, both of you guys have. But we're moving this field forward. And just as, you know, gosh, back in the 90s, I remember a, a, a friend of mine saying, you know, I, hey, do they have an email? Do they know what email is? 
uh, which a lot of people listening tonight will laugh about that. But we're all old enough to know that what that was going on back in, in that day. That, and no, I don't have an email address. I still get my, my mail in the, the mailbox, you know. Uh huh. Um, if you think of the leaps and bounds that we've made, because now we get our mail on the little phone that I'm talking on or, the you, you know, that you carry around that's the size of a deck of cards and our pockets that you can take pictures with, play solitaire on, and everything else, that it's really important that the younger generation of the people that are watching the shows such as yours that are listening to the shows like Casey tonight, that we embrace them and teach them what we've learned and try to pass on what we're doing in the paranormal community because they're going to carry it on. They're going to take it to that next level when they mm-hmm. look back and say, these guys were on this stuff. Some of the things they, they were very close to a breakthrough on and some of the things they were kind of in the wrong direction. But if they hadn't been doing what they were doing, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. That mm-hmm. I think that that's something that's not talked enough about that I would like to see the community start to embrace the younger generation uh, and bring them in and, and, and tutor them and take them along because if we don't, we're going to lose what we've gained. Do you well, agree? I, I I agree 100% with you. You have to remember, we live in a society that people are so disconnected. Um, people don't pick up the phone and talk like they used to. Everything's email or, uh, you know, one of these crazy things that everybody communicates on and goes back and forth. There's a huge disconnect today where before when... You know, we wanted to learn something about the paranormal. What did we do? We'd go out, we would get a book, we'd go to these locations, and we would do what we could. We would try to find people that had experiences or something and talk to them. Today, that that's extremely uh, disconnected, and um, I think it's uh, very important that, you know, the younger generation understand that, there, there's so much more. I mean, just, you know, over the course of today, and it, you know, and it kind of bothered me. I've seen this crazy posting going up, uh, people referring to the fathers of the paranormal, Jason Grant, Zach, and John Zaffis. We're not the fathers of the paranormal. We are not. We have hundreds of years worth of people dating all the all the way back to England in the mid-1800s. You know, they called it the Cycles of Society where, you know, all these professors and different people were in there experimenting and doing all these things with the paranormal, you know, this is, you know, and it bothered me because it was like, my gosh, all these people that, you know, started our movement in the paranormal, a lot of these people don't even know who they are today. And that's scary. That's scary. It's really scary. I mean, again, you know, the forefronters, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren, Hulser, Roll, all these guys are the in-betweeners there. They started breaking down the doors and going into the media and bringing things to the forefront. And today you have this whole other uh, generation of us with all the the TV TV shows out there. But when I was sitting reading some of the comments back on this, I just sat there and went, my gosh, do any of these guys even realize who the true fathers of the paranormal really are? Exactly, indeed, to it. I, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, and, uh, again, uh, those people who really are involved with this community do understand and do know uh, what uh, history uh, that this field has and how far back that it goes. And uh, uh, in answer to uh, the question you asked me before, too, John, as far as the uh, the aspect of how you'll be remembered, uh, in another 40 years of investigating that you still have to continue at the end of your road when you have uh, that point in time that you're time to move on, I think on your tombstone it should just read, What the hell was that? Which would, I, did, uh, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that got put on there or the other famous one too. What the F is going on around here? <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, John, let me throw this in there real quick, and when I know we're short on time, I have thought about uh, myself in a mausoleum, and I've talked to my sister if she wants to join me in the family one that we're going to put up. When you open the door, a recorder that will go off with your voice, I think that would be fantastic in a mausoleum. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that 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 would definitely be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the I do, John. Uh, right after you cross over, make sure you make initial contact with us. We'll do a spirit box session with you. You know, the funny thing is, once I'm done and I'm out of here, I always joked and said I'm going to haunt everybody. But you know what? I think I'm going to be tired, done with the paranormal, 
and I want to cross over, be left alone. <laughs> You're just going to attach yourself to a nice Lamborghini and just travel the country. Oh, gosh, no, George. I'll get accused of stealing that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John Zappis, I want to thank you, as always, for taking the time out and coming out of the show. Uh, congratulations on an incredible season three, season finale uh, for Haunted Collector, this Wednesday, uh, June 5th, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Sci-Fi Channel. Check your local listings. Mr. Zaffis, Mr. John Zaffis, thank you so much for joining us again tonight, sir, and we wish you all the best. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. It was a great show. Uh, thanks, thank John. you. It thank was great you, guys. Because you. Good night. Have a great week, sir. Bye-bye. Take care. Fantastic again, Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, real quick, a uh, short time remaining here. I know tomorrow night we've got uh, Jeff Leeper, Don't Fear the Leaper. Uh, Tuesday night and Wednesday, of course, uh, Paranormal Kool-Aid. Who do we got joining us then, sir? A special 60-minute episode. Uh, Pamela Croker promo this on the Kool-Aid page. Will Obamacare ever cover paranormal psychology evaluations for attached entities or possession in the future? Find this out and more with Dr. Rita Louise, a Ph.D., joins the crew on Wednesday. Phenomenal. Thursday night, of course. Go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. I was just going to say we'll see you Wednesday for that one. And uh, Thursday, Paranormal Hood with Joey Jiggy Webb. Uh, Friday night, Club Power with uh, Riley Black. Saturday night, Resurrection Radio with Laura Calhoun. Rounding off the week, Sunday Night Dead with Mr. Matthew Slozer. On behalf of Mr. Bowler and myself, I wish you guys a great week. Uh, enjoy the summer weather, and we will be talking to you soon. Until then, keep the lights on. Have a great night.